Let's get started. How to this one is not traditionally an applications course. Um, how to this is a very applied field of mathematics. But how to this one is mainly just teaching students to do things without a lot of uh, explanation as to why you would want to do things. And that can be a little demoralizing. So we do occasionally have these application sections where we try to convince people that we're not totally wasting their time. Let's do a few things in this section. And the first thing we're going to do is just talk about the derivative some more, but maybe in a slightly more applied context. And let's come back to a question that I've sort of addressed, but could certainly stand to address some more. What is the derivative? I mean, we have kind of wrote answers to that question. The derivative is the rate of change of a function. <laughs> or we haven't used this in a while, but the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. <clears throat> Sorry, an understanding of the derivative that's a little less formal than this, but is maybe intuitively easier to understand, shows up a lot in business and other applications. And this un informal understanding of the derivative is that f prime of k is the amount that f of k will change if k increases by one. Let's try to understand derivatives, at least for a moment, in this kind of informal way, because certainly I think that when we understand what we're saying here, it's going to be a lot more tractable than the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. And for this, let's Look at a sort of major neutral application. I said we'll look at business applications, which we will, but also we don't have any business majors in the room. So let's look at something first that isn't related to business. The Thurstone memory function. So Thurstone was a psychologist and memory, of course, is kind of a big field or at one point was kind of a big field in psychology. Like 
when like all the advice you've probably received that when you're studying for tests, you shouldn't cram, you should study in smaller chunks. That all comes ultimately from the field of psychology and from people like this. And Thurston tried to study psychology and memory mathematically. And he came up, well, he came up with a lot of functions, but this is the one that we are going to look at. So Thurston asked himself, um, after you memorize facts, what happens? I mean, you'll presumably eventually start to forget them, assuming that they're in your short term rather than your long term memory. But speaking sort of more concretely, how quickly will you forget those facts you learn? And this is kind of the simplest equation that he gave to try to model that situation. So here, T is the number of hours since you stop studying. <clears throat> And N of T should be the number of facts retained. This is kind of an odd looking function in many ways. Um, it doesn't work for very small values of T because for very small values of T, you end up with negative numbers. But let's take this function and let's just try to understand the derivative in terms of it. Let's look at n of three and then let's look at the derivative at three and try to understand each of those in turn. So I'm going to <laughs> Forgot to get our calculator. What, what is this? TI something, TI smart view. Have to give this a second to load. Now it connects to servers and convinces itself that we're not pirating it. And now that this is up, let's share it. We no longer see the whiteboard, but I have this written down. So let's use parentheses. 80 times three divided by 105 times three minus 80. Here's hoping we don't get something weird. We don't. So we get 1.021. And there are a lot of a lot of assumptions going on behind the scene of this equation I've given you. I mean, I haven't given you 
details like how long did we spend studying in the first place or how good is this student at memorizing stuff the Eighty and this one hundred and five and this eighty as well are parameters that could change from student to student, from subject to subject, and so on. So this isn't a psychology class, but I should clarify that the Thurston memory function is actually a class of functions where those numbers change depending on various factors. But anyway, after three hours, the student remembers about one fact. So that's just interpreting a function. This T is the input, it's the number of hours, N of T is the number of facts retained. The statement that N of three equals 1.021 means what we have written on the board. That to make my algebra students do that. That's not what we're here for. Let's look at the derivative of this thing. And let's try to understand the derivative at three. Um, not to belabor what might be obvious, but to find the derivative at three, we have to find the derivative of this function and then plug three into that. We do not just take this and differentiate it. If we did that, we'd end up with zero. The derivative of 1.021 is zero. So let's take this and differentiate it. And this is going to be a quotient rule problem, but it doesn't seem to me to be a particularly hideous quotient rule problem. I sort of indicated yesterday that those really ugly ones tend to be classroom exercises. N prime of T. So not being super ugly doesn't mean we couldn't slip up. So let's take things a little slowly. To use the quotient rule, we need to sort of take our numerator and our denominator, and we need to take some derivatives and combine them in various ways. The derivative of the top is 80 times the bottom. And we're not taking the derivative of the bottom, we're just leaving it be. And then we've got this sort of pseudo product rule thing. We have subtraction instead of addition. And this time the top gets left alone. 
and the bottom is differentiated. And I'm hoping that we can take sort of these derivatives pretty sort of basically without comment at this point. The derivative of a constant times t is the constant. The derivative of negative 80 is zero. So 105 minus zero is 105. And the denominator now shows up a second time. There are no, um, no derivatives there in the denominator, but it's being squared. It is having something done to it. And that's, I'm not uh, not a stickler for simplification, but that top really ought to be simplified. This is just a linear expression. So we're going to have Zoom does this thing where it kind of paralyzes this calculator app. Let's try that again. What I would like is to move this around so that I can see what I'm simplifying as well as the calculator. Online students aren't seeing anything right now because if I share the calculator, the whiteboard will just go away. But we have it 80 times a 105 T. <coughs> so 80, times 105, and then we have a 80 times 105t. I wasn't uh, totally expecting that, but I don't think we've done anything wrong. So this 80 times 105t, and this 80, negative 80 times 105t should cancel and give us zero. And we should be left only with 80 times negative 80. 80 times 80, 80 squared, 6,400. And in the bottom, this 105t. Minus 80 squared. Is this looking correct to all of you? Anyone? Uh, does everyone agree with all of this? If we do, we can answer this question that I have circled in blue on the previous frame um, and stick three into this. Again, I'm not going to share this so online students aren't going to be able to see me type this out, but I'm typing in negative 6,400 divided by 105 times three 
minus 80 squared. Negative 0 0.116. So you, all, you need to uh, always apply a certain amount of common sense when you're applying mathematics to things that take on integer values. But what this is saying is that, you know, combining this and the previous answer, after three hours, the student remembers one point zero two one. Thanks. And as I say, when you use calculus to study things that are measured in counting numbers, you just have to kind of get used to these sort of goofy statements. I mean, what's one, what's point zero two one of a fact? We kind of wave that away. But after another hour has passed, so that is to say after four hours total, The student is forgetting stuff. In particular, the student forgets about zero point one six one one six pieces of information. Why, why forgets? And what happened to that negative sign? Well, those two questions are related to each other. The rate of change is negative. So the number of things the student remembers is decreasing. That is to say, the student is forgetting material instead of memorizing new material. So this negative sign gave us this word forgets there. And this sort of application, as I say, um, I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's easy. Well, I shouldn't say easy because calculus isn't easy, but it's certainly more intuitive if you're trying to explain the derivative to someone than defining the tangent line and then trying to explain that the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. And as far as sort of understanding the derivative goes, this is probably the most intuitive way we can do it. We should remember our caveat. These are approximations. So that we actually 
let me actually shove the word about in there to drive home that this understanding of the derivative is not an exact one. Let's look at a second question, first of all. Let's look at a second example. My in the class students have seen this briefly. The effective population size. So when biologists are measuring the size and health of an animal population, it's not always very useful to just count the number of animals in a population. Um, to give an extreme example, <coughs> suppose you have an animal population, and this animal population contains a hundred thousand animals, but all of those animals are male. Well, with apologies to Jurassic Park and Michael Crichton, maybe that's a pretty dated reference but this will just end with the animal population going extinct. So there are plenty of animals in the population, but the population is already doomed. I mean, you think there might as well be zero animals in the population if they're trying to talk about its long-term health. So effective population size is how biologists and zoologists and ecologists try to get at to this. They acknowledge that sometimes just counting the animals is not a very good way of measuring the health of the population size. And how effective population size is measured varies from animal to animal and from species to species. But here's a very famous, I mean, to the extent that any mathematical equation is famous, here's a very famous example of an effective population size formula. And we're looking at cattle male bulls, female cows. And the effective population size of a cattle population is four, you don't need to memorize this, but it's four times the number of bulls times the number of cows divided by the number of bulls plus the number of cows. And we don't know how to deal with it when we have multiple variables. 
was in, um, that's what calculus three is for. So we're going to instantly um, simplify this by fixing the number of boulders. Let's say you have five boulders and we're not going to change that number. We're not planning to buy any more. They're healthy, so we don't anticipate losing any to disease. Then the effective population size turns into a function of the number of cows you have. So four times five is 20. When DC on top, five plus C on the bottom. And let's say the farmer has some number of cows, let's say 20. Let's interpret F of 20. And then let's also interpret F prime of 20. Oh, in light of this informal understanding of the derivative. F of 20, well, we're probably gonna want to do the derivative on its own frame, so no need to cramp myself. F of 20 is 20 times 20. divided by five plus 20. <clears throat> Again, because this isn't, there's nothing interesting happening in the calculator. I'm not going to share it. I'm just going to take 20 is squared divided by 25. And I'm going to get 16. A nice natural number. Does everybody agree with that? So what's this saying? This is saying that the, this herd of cattle is less healthy or less robust than merely counting the number of animals in it would make it see. There are 25 animals in this population. There are five males and 20 females. But the effective population size is less than that. It's only 16. And this happens, I mean, not to be crude, but the health of a population is measured by its ability to reproduce. And having only five males in this population is limiting its ability to reproduce as a result of that. Um, 
And now let's ask about F prime of 20. And to find F prime of 20, we'll first have to find F prime of X, then we'll throw 20 in there. So we need our function. Let me copy that onto another frame. 20C plus divided by five plus C. This is a quotient rule problem, but as with many word problems, the quotient rule isn't really so bad. You just need to take it slow. And of course, you need to make sure you use the quotient rule. There's nothing more frustrating for me than when I look at a test and a student just says, well, this is 20 divided by one. Um, the quotient rule says to take the derivative of the top, the derivative of 20C is 20. C is our variable here. Often C is used as a constant, but here C is our variable. It's the number of cows. So we take the derivative of the top, we multiply it by the bottom. Then we leave the top alone and take the derivative of the bottom, all divided by the bottom square. And I shouldn't need to go to, uh, I hope this isn't, I just use different colors when I'm afraid that, that my writing might run together otherwise. I hope it's not sort of confusing anyone. We should be able to do this in our head because 20 times five, is 100, and then we have 20 times C, but we also have negative 20 times C. So once again, we just um, wind up with a constant up top. And in the denominator, we just have five plus C squared. And to answer our question, find the derivative at 20. We're going to take 20 and we are going to plug it into this. One hundred divided by five plus twenty squared, and we wind up with point sixteen. But what? What does that mean? How do we interpret it? Well, suppose we have 20 cows 
and we decide we want to increase the size of this herd. Well, buying another cow only increases the effective population size by zero point Sixteen. So you're really in a point of diminishing returns here. If you're trying to increase the health of this animal population, at this point, increasing the number of cows by one is effectively the same as increasing the number of cows by 0.16, and you're getting less than a fifth of your investment, basically. And this is, I mean, if we give it some thought, it makes sense. I mean, Bulls are much more expensive than the cows. If you could maintain a healthy herd by just buying one or two bulls and then buying hundreds of cows, that's what people would do, right? But it doesn't work that way way, if you fix the number of bulls and start buying cows, you very quickly run into these diminishing returns. And even though you're adding more animals to the herd, it's not causing the herd to be any healthier. And using help to this, we can quantify this. Any questions about this example? Let's see, help to this can the way it's taught can sometimes give kind of a distorted a distorted view of how it's actually used. This is sort of not a new topic because it's still related to applications, but different from the two word problems we did. I mean, outside of a text you're very rarely going to have all of these formed of us. You're going to have, I mean, well, that, let's give an example. Suppose a company is looking at the money spent on advertising, let's say measured in thousands, and they want to get a return in investment on this money. So let's compare the money spent on advertising versus the number of sales. 
and maybe they ramp up an advertising campaign and a somewhat realistic graph would look something like this. Maybe X will go up to 50. Why maybe this can be 10,000. And as they've increased the amount they spend on advertising, they see something like this. And the question they ask themselves is, if we increase advertising, further, what, I'm running out of space, so let me state this informally, what will the sales do? And in particular, will the company make enough money on additional sales that it's worthwhile for them to increase the amount of advertising budget further? And currently, the company is spending 50 $50,000 on advertising. Well, what they're really interested in is F prime of 50. If they throw another thousand dollars into advertising, how many new sales will that net them? But sort of the issue with that is that they don't have a nice formula to use the quotient rule on or to use the product rule on. So how do they know what F prime of 50 is? Well, here's where um, the de fact that the derivative is the slope of a tangent line really pays off in a lot of very concrete settings. Because from this graph, we have enough information to sketch the tangent line. And once we've sketched a tangent line, we can approximate its slope. This tangent line is very close to being horizontal. Let's say it has a slope of 0 0.001. And then we can use calculus to answer the question at hand without having a form to the, and without using any of these fancy rules. Spending another thousand dollars on advertising will generate 0 0.001 of a sale, it's almost certainly not a worthwhile investment unless for some kind of crazy military contractor that's selling things that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. 
So that's sort of how cultivist tends to get used in the real world, as it were, and will continue, you know, to do stuff with formulas and learn how to take derivatives, but I'd feel that I was falling down on my job if I didn't at least address the extremely obvious question of how you can use this material when most of the time you don't have nice form to those to work with. The answer to that question is the tangent line. As long as you have a graph, you can estimate derivatives, and then you can use them in the way that we did today. We'll continue on with applications where um, we're expanding 